Welcome to the Mindset Game podcast. I am so excited to introduce you to Dre Baldwin. He is the CEO and founder of Work on Your Game Incorporated. He's given four TEDx talks and has authored 33 books, nine-year professional basketball career playing in eight countries, and Dre's framework is the roadmap in reverse for professional mindset, strategy, systems, and execution. And I can't wait to hear more about that. And I'm so excited to have this conversation with you, Dre. Welcome. I'm excited to be here, Veretta. Hope, hopefully I can live up to my bio. I'm looking oh forward to this conversation. <laughs> From everything that I've read and seen, I'm certain of it. And uh, I know that uh, you're a big believer in the power of mindset, which is what this show is all about. So really excited to kind of go there with you today and learn from you. So let's start with a little bit of your background. I'm curious about how your background in athletics, uh, sports has kind of uh, led you to this uh, expertise and mindset. Man, that's a great question. And I think we can have a whole conversation around that. I think that's what we're about to do. So, uh, yeah, my background was I was always into sports growing up, you know, played every did a little bit of every sport, didn't really play. My first team sport was uh, played a little bit of football, but my family couldn't afford equipment, so I never really played football. Played baseball, but I wasn't really that good at it. My ceiling was probably a mediocre high school, maybe college player, but I would have sat on the bench if I had played in college. Then I went to uh, basketball around age 14, which is pretty late for a player who's trying to go somewhere in basketball, like to play in college, let alone the pros. But that was the situation. Only played one year in high school on the basketball team and didn't really play. I scored uh, two points a game the, my senior year in high school. That was the one year I was on the team. And I don't know how much your audience knows sports, but two points in basketball is not a lot. <laughs> now, I, I tell people two points in hockey or soccer, you're a legend. But two points in basketball, you're nobody. So <laughs> I got out of high school, still wanted to play basketball. And I was going to go to college either way, just on you know, academically and personally. So I went to college and I walked on at the school I was at. Now, walking on just means you're not invited. Nobody knows you. You literally walk into the gym and try to earn your way onto the team, which I was able to do, which is good. But I was playing at the Division Three level, which is the third tier of college sports. So most of the players that anybody who knows sports, even casually, the players you see on TV, NFL, NBA, they come from Division One. I. I was at a Division Three school. So most players who play Division Three are not even ambitious about playing pro. They just play because they can and they know that this is over when college is over. So I played in college. And I still had this, I was dumb enough to believe that I could keep trying. I could keep playing professionally after college. So my first year out of school, actually, I didn't even get an opportunity. It was not like coming out of division three school. Again, the scouts are not looking at you. So it's not like it was a bunch of people knocking on my door, like, Hey, Dre, come play for this team or that team. So I was going, if I was going to play, I was going to have to go to them. They were not coming to me. So my first year out of school, I didn't have any opportunities presented to me. I worked a couple of quote unquote regular jobs. I worked at Foot Locker as an assistant manager. I worked at a gym called Bally Total Fitness, selling gym memberships. You remember Bally? Um, they're out of business now, not because of me, because I sold a lot of memberships. I, I, I was one of the top salespeople <laughs> in my location. But uh, this, uh, and to give everybody a frame here, this is 2004, and that matters. And I'll explain to you why in a second. So that year, I worked those two jobs, six months apiece. In the summer of 2005, I went to this event called an exposure camp. Uh, you familiar with what those are, Brett? Ever heard of them? Okay, so an exposure camp is like a job fair. Everybody's familiar with those. So a job fair, people who don't have jobs or you want a better job, you show up, you bring it, you put on a suit, you bring your resume and you basically shake hands and talk yourself up and hopefully talk yourself into an interview, right? An opportunity. So in the sports world, exposure camps are similar, except you don't just talk. You bring your sneakers and your gear and you play. And you prove that you can actually perform. Now, the thing is, these things are like casting calls. They're like meat markets because everybody there is trying to prove that they're good enough to play at the next level. So you're competing against everybody else there is not the same as a job fair in that sense. So at this exposure camp, there's only two days. So this is not like some week long thing. It's two days. You pay to go to these events. Also, they're not free. You pay to go to this event. And for two days, you're playing in front of an audience of coaches, scouts, agents, managers, and owners of basketball teams from around the world, because these are destination events. So someone throws this event and they let all the teams know, hey, if you're looking for talent, come to this event and we're going to gather all the talent. You come here and you can find your next employee, basically. So these are big deals for athletes who are trying to play pro because a lot of us are, again, they're doing like I'm doing. You're working at Foot Lockers and Bally Total Fitnesses, just trying to hold on until the 
to hit the lottery, right? To play pro. So I paid $250 in cash at the door to go to this event. This is in Orlando, Florida, by the way. So I'm from Philadelphia. And me and a couple of teammates rented a car in Philly on Friday afternoon, drove from Philly to Orlando. For those who don't know the geography, that's about a 15 hour drive. We hopped out of the car 9 a.m. Saturday morning. The camp started at 9 a.m. Saturday morning. So I tell people at age 23, I can get away with that. I couldn't do it now, but I could do it then. So I hopped out of the car uh, 9 a.m. Saturday morning, and you had two days. Paid 250 in cash because at the time I didn't have a bank account or a credit card. So I called them and said, hey, can I pay in cash? And they said, yeah, you can pay in cash. They would have took anybody's money, but and that's a different story. They <laughs> got me paid the 250 in cash. And Saturday, Sunday, I was either, it was either sink or swim. And it basically make my career happen there. And I played pretty well at this event. So that's how what happened is I got a good a scouting report, which is basically a third party verified source saying, hey, this guy is good enough to play pro, which is a lot more uh, validating than me saying I'm good enough. Right. So somebody else uh, validating me. And then I got the footage from that event. The thing is, I did not get signed to a contract on the spot. So this was not some fairy tale. Monday morning, camp was Saturday, Sunday, Monday morning, I had to be back at work, Bally Total Fitness. So when that camp ended on Sunday, we hopped back in that car and drove back to Philly. So I had to be back at work. And what I started doing, Verit, is I started, and all of this is connected to what I talk about now. Uh, I got back home. I'm back at work. I started looking on Google, which did exist at that time. It's not as robust as it is now, but it did exist. And I started Googling basketball agents because at this point, I know my career is probably going to be overseas. I knew that an NBA team wasn't going to call me off for this, but I could play professionally overseas. So I figured I've barely been out of the state of Pennsylvania that much in my life. I don't know anybody in Europe. So how am I going to get over there? So I figured an agent would know somebody. So agents in the sports world are the same as literary agents, speaking agents, you no know, actors, agents, same thing. They're basically the go-between between the talent and the jobs. So I figured if I can get an agent to represent me, they know people overseas and they can help me get a job. That was my reasoning. So I started Googling basketball agents and any agent I saw read who had a phone number or an email address, I was cold calling, literally calling these agents and saying, hey, here's who I am. And at this point, I have some collateral because now I have my scouting report and I have my footage. Now, the year earlier, I could have did this year before, but I had nothing to offer them. Now I had something to offer. So now I'm showing them, hey, I got the scouting report. Here's the link to the scouting report. I have this footage. So they said, okay. I called about 60 agents, literally cold calls. And of these 60, 20 of them said, okay, let me see what you have. Let me see what you got. And I would send them my link and I would also send them my footage. Now, mind you, this is the summer of 2005. So we don't have links for footage. My footage is on this thing called a VHS tape. You remember those? <laughs> <laughs> okay so by your laugh i'm guessing that's a yes okay so all right, and any millennials listening to this and you're under 35 don't know what that is ask your parents or google it you'll know what a vhs tape is so my foot is on a vhs tape so at this time i had a double decker vcr at home again under 35 you can google a vcr all right this the vcr is what you use to play the vhs so i would make copies of the vhs tape i went to this drugstore called eckert that's another one under 35 google eckert i don't think they're in business anymore but i would go there and i would buy a 10 pack of blank vhs tapes and make copies of this footage because i couldn't give away the main tape i needed that tape so i would make copies of the vhs tape and i was mailing them out to these agents who asked to see it in bubble mailers and mind you they're not paying me for this this is all on my dime because i'm trying to get them to represent me so the 20 agents i sent my footage to one of them replied to my follow-up and said i'll represent you he was the one who signed me and when an agent signs you you don't get any money they just say they're going to represent you and help you try to help you make money and he's the one who helped me get my first job so my first job was in countess lithuania in uh, late August 2005. And I'll tell you one more piece to this. This is how I got started. That later on that year, because now I have this VHS tape, this is the most valuable footage I owned of me playing well at this exposure camp because I'm playing against other pro level players as opposed to the division three guys I played against in college. So this is very important footage. There was a website that came out that said, look, you can put footage on this website for free and you can put up as much as you want it doesn't matter how much it's called youtube.com and that's where i took this footage i uploaded it to youtube i got to put on an audio i went to an audio visual store and i had to pay them like 65 bucks to take the footage off the vhs and put it on a data cd and i took that data cd put it in the computer uploaded it to this new website youtube and i didn't think anything of it because who cares about youtube in 2005 nobody 
And nobody's looking for me. It's not like anybody's going on the internet and Googling Dre Baldwin. I came out of the Division Three school and I just signed my first contract and I'm overseas. So, I mean, name somebody who plays basketball overseas. And most people probably can't name one person, right? So even though I'm playing, nobody knows me. So I put the video up on YouTube and forgot about it. Six months later, I go back to YouTube and I notice that there are comments on my video. And I don't know these people, but there are people commenting. They're like, man, who, who are you? Where'd you play? Where are you from? Who taught you? How often do you practice? And what I realized, a light bulb went off my head immediately. These players are not looking for me. They're just looking for someone who can teach them how to play basketball. And he looks like he knows what he's doing. So they saw me. I just looked like somebody who knew what I was doing. So they started asking me questions. And I figured, oh, well, these players, they are basically me just 10 years younger. They just need to learn how to play ball, but nobody can teach them. The good thing for them is that they can go to the internet and get information. They can crowdsource information off random people on the internet. Whereas us, you know, my generation back in the nineties, either you figured it out or you knew somebody or that was it. You didn't have any other options. So I figured, okay, these players just want to learn how to play ball. So I said, all right, I go to the gym every day anyway. So at this point I had a cheap little hundred dollar camera. This is before we had video cameras on the phones, right? So you had to have a phone and a camera, these two different devices. So I figured I go to the gym every day anyway. I practice every day anyway. I figured every basketball player practiced every day. I realized that was not the case, but different story. I said, let me just take this camera with me to the gym every day and I'll just record myself working out and I'll take little pieces of it and put it on YouTube. Why not? I mean, if I can help these players out, it's not a lot of extra work. It's not an extra skin off my back to do it. Now, at the time, though, I would still only do this sporadically because, again, there's no money to be made on YouTube. There's no we were not using the term social media. Content did not exist. There were no influencers. And again, you couldn't make money off this. So I wasn't. It's not like I said immediately, OK, I got a whole business plan here. No, that was not the thing. This is 2005 through 2009. There's no money to be made by posting material on the Internet for free. We were Again, we weren't even calling it content. So I would just put this up randomly. Mind you, I'm still playing overseas. I'm in between jobs. I'm going to different jobs, different countries and things like that. And then it was in 2000. And so now I had these two careers going. But again, the Internet is not a career. It's just a thing. It, later on, retroactively, I can tell you it was a career. So then in 2009, I found myself unemployed. So in professional sports, professional athletes careers, unlike what you see, like not like the LeBron James guys, because there's only one LeBron James. Right. So for every one LeBron, you got about a thousand Dre Baldwin's who are we're pro, but you don't know us. Right. And our careers are similar to like an actor or an actress. And again, not uh, Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, Jennifer Aniston, act actors and actresses, but the ones that they're there, but you don't know them. Those people where we're in between jobs, like when's that next phone call coming? You're calling your agent like, hey, what's going on? So we had those situations in sports the same way. So I found myself unemployed. And I had just finished reading basically the new, the digital age version of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which was Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. And he was basically taking the same principles that Robert Kiyosaki wrote about in Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he had basically digitized them for the digital age. How can you take these same principles and do it using the Internet? And the book, the ideas in that book led me to asking myself a very important question that kind of led us to where we are today, which was my question was, Dre, how can I combine? playing basketball, which is what I wanted to do, wanted to keep doing, making money, which is what I also wanted and needed to do, and having control. That's the third part. Because see, when you play professional sports, you're not in control. You are basically a contracted employee. And when that contract's up, you're unemployed. You have no job and no revenue. So how can I combine all three? Good news was at that exact time, now all these things that we now know about started to exist. Social media, content, influencers and there was a way you can make money from it and tim ferris planted some seeds of ideas of how can you make your own products and sell them now at this point i have a little audience because i've been putting these videos on youtube sporadically but not consistently because again from that time 2005 through 2009 if you were making content on the internet for a living, you were a bum living in your parents' basement who needed to get a real job and you know, take a shower, right? So that that's what that was up to that point. But now it was starting to become a thing because now YouTube was purchased by Google. And now Google said, okay, we'll give you some ad revenue for putting your videos up. And now having a fan base on the internet was actually, you were cool if you had a fan base on the internet. This is starting to become a thing. And I had a fan base on the internet. So, and again, I hadn't even been trying to do it. Now I started doing it on purpose. Now it became intentional. I started writing more often because I've always been a big writer. 
even before the videos, writing, uh, making videos every day because I went to the gym every day. So I figured, why not just put a video on YouTube every day? If they don't give me money for it, I'll do it every day. So I started putting videos up every day. And that's where the brand started was around that 2009 time. I started creating my own products. And again, my first products is not like I'm making some $10,000 mastermind. I'm selling $4.99 training programs to 13 to 24 year old basketball players. That's what I was selling. But we sold them in volume because I had such I had an audience and I had already built up the no like trust factors because I've been putting videos out for free for four years asking for nothing in exchange. So when I started selling things, I didn't have to build the no like and trust factor. It was already there. So that's how uh, the brand, the Dre all day work on your game brand came to exist. And the good news is on top of that, the phone did ring again. I did keep playing pro ball. I kept playing until 2015. So let me uh, shorten up the rest of the story here so you can ask a question. <laughs> so in uh, 2000, from 2009 to around 2010, another thing happened. Um, the players who were watching me, they would hear about my background because I would respond. I always read and responded to all the comments. You now I tell people, um, I wouldn't suggest you read and respond to all the comments on YouTube these days, but I always did. I, I would always read the comments and respond. And players would just ask me about my background because they see this guy who clearly he knows how to play basketball. He's good, but we never heard of him. Who is he? And he's putting content on the internet for free again before putting content on the internet for free was a normal thing. So why are you doing this? So they would ask me stuff about my background. They would found out the same things that I told you. One year high school ball, walked on at a D3 college, hustled my way into the pros. And a lot of these players could really relate to me because, again, you can admire LeBron and Kobe Bryant, but you cannot relate to them because you were not the superstar since you were 10 years old. They were. I was not. And most players were not that. So they could relate to me, even though they admire LeBron. So when I told them my story, a lot of them would just ask me questions because they wanted to know what was going through my mind to get through the same challenges that they were currently facing. Like, Dre, I just got cut from my high school team, too. I'm trying to play in college and I'm at this small college and nobody's heard of me either. How can I do the same thing that you did? So I started talking about things like, because they would ask me questions like, what kept you coming to the gym every day to work out? Or how do you have the same confidence in a game that you have in practice? Or you got cut from your high school team. You walked on in college. You know, how'd you keep the vision alive? You could even become a pro athlete because that's a very far-fetched idea, being honest. Even though I did it, it's still a far-fetched idea. You had to be kind of crazy to believe that. And then they would ask how I got started getting known on the internet because now getting known on the internet, career aspirations. So now you, know, you ask a 15 year old what they want to be for a living. It's not a police officer or an astronaut. They want to be a YouTuber, right? They want to be an influencer. And I was, I guess, an influencer. So I started talking about things like discipline, confidence, mental toughness, personal initiative. And I would do these videos every Monday. Verrett, I did this video every Monday called the weekly motivation. And that was just a little two to five minute selfie video. Again, four selfie videos were cool. And I was just give some mindset principle that was just on my mind, something I was thinking about. And again, I thought everybody thought like this. I thought anyone who was successful thought this way. And I realized, I came to realize very quickly that this was not a normal thing. So when I started talking about these things, people would say, wow, I never thought about it that way. Or that's very interesting. Or wow, like the way you're talking about this, Dre, like, I know you're a basketball guy, but you sound like a philosopher. You sound like a college <laughs> professor. And that's what they would say to me. And then this is where the inflection point people who didn't play sports started finding me when I started talking about these things. And they would say, look, uh, my son was watching your video, but I heard what you were saying and I got interested. Mm -hmm. Or people who didn't play sports said, look, I follow you on YouTube, not for the six days a week you're talking about basketball, but that one day when you do the weekly motivation, I watch that one. And that told me, oh, my, I'm not limited to just talking to ball players. I could talk to anybody with this. So by the time I stopped playing ball in 2015, I'd already started writing books and I already knew exactly what I was going to do. I was going to take just this part, the mindset piece, and I was going to serve people who didn't play sports. Because one thing that I understood is that in sports, you're only as popular as the last game that you played. Now, what if you don't have any games? Like the athletes don't want to hear you. So if you ask some 15 year old ball player today about Dre Baldwin, they're like, who? All right. Because I haven't played ball since 2015. So they don't know me. But the people, when I was playing, I was the guy. But as soon as I stopped playing, I'm not the guy to basketball players anymore. But mentally, uh, the mindset piece and using my communication skills, I can be somebody to people like this audience forever. But basketball, you can't play forever. So I knew that that, that had a shelf life. And I didn't want to be a coach. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to move on into something else. So that's how I knew what I would do next. So in 2015, my transition from sports to business was a little bit smoother than most athletes. 
ironically, only because of the fact that sometimes I didn't have a job. So I had to focus on what would happen next because I didn't know when next was going to happen. Right. I didn't know I was going to get another phone call in 2009. Luckily, I did. But had I not, I would have jumped into this even earlier. But that's how it all happened. So that's the 20 minute version of my two minute story. That's how we got here. <laughs> well, there, there are so many juicy, juicy lessons uh, mm-hmm. in that story. So I'm grateful that you shared it because I imagine many of the people listening are in those shoes, right? Whether they're basketball mm-hmm. shoes, so to speak, or other shoes in the sense that, you know, they had to hustle to get to where they got, or they're trying really, really hard and they're not yet getting what they want because mm-hmm. there is a missing piece to the puzzle. And I've heard you say that that missing piece is mindset. Um, so tell me more about what that means to you and, and how did you know embracing a particular mindset help you to get to where you are today? Because it is very inspiring to people, whether it's kiddos that want to make it in pro basketball or pro anything, um, mm-hmm. or that uh, people that really want to believe that something is possible for them? Wow, great question. And uh, so many different angles to go to. Uh, The first thing is that at some point in life, anyone who becomes a quote unquote success has to have some kind of belief that goes against the grain. Uh, You have to have something that you believe that most people might think is crazy or think is unreasonable or outside of the box. And for me, it was just believing that I could go from I mean, every step in sports, I had to have that kind of belief that didn't really make sense. And there was nobody who was going to co-sign that belief. I had to co-sign myself basically and run off my own energy because, again, you only play one year high school. Why even think about playing in college or you play the small college that doesn't produce pros? Why think about playing in the pros? Then even that first year, you're working at Foot Locker. Why do you think you're going to go from playing it, working at Foot Locker to playing professional basketball? What sense does that make? So all of these different times and then even with the Internet. Like what makes you think it's even worth it to put energy into putting stuff on the internet? Who cares? Right. And then when all of those things started to work out and what I tell people is that uh, the difference between being a, a visionary, uh, a visionary leader and being a delusional fool is the end of the story. It just depends on how the story goes. Now, had I not made it as a pro had the internet not become the internet, then all of those investments would have meant nothing. And we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. But because they did, now I can look back and you know make myself look like a superhero because it worked out. But and I mean, that's kind of how life is. It, we don't know until the story's over. And what I tell people is that when you face a setback, you have to put a comment instead of a period. Because mm-hmm. when you face a setback in life, well, in a sentence, sentence structure, a comma means what? It means that there's more thoughts coming. We're not done. I'm not finished making my statement. When you put a period, that means it's over. All right, the thoughts are done. So that comma instead of a period is really a, a mental toughness thing. Barrett is the mental toughness of okay, I did face a setback here, but I'm not finished. We're and that's a choice. That's a choice. Are you going to put a period there? Or are you going to put a comma? And we all face setbacks. We all face situations when things are not working. And many people feel like, especially when they're in a point when things are not working, they're at a valley. They're looking around. It looks like everybody else's stuff is working and only theirs is not working. But what I tell people is that everybody goes through the same challenges in different forms, but everybody goes through challenges. The difference is who keeps going and who doesn't keep going. And how do you deal with the challenges that you face? That's the only thing that makes the difference between people is not whether or not you face stuff. It's just how do you deal with it? Thank you. So how do we deal with it when when the setbacks happen? Oh, great question. Um, a lot of there are a lot of different forms of setbacks, and this is why I've always tell people that mindset is the foundation of succeeding is a foundation of failing, and having this the mental conditioning is really the first thing. The mental conditioning is basically getting yourself in shape so that whatever happens to come up, you are prepared to handle it. And uh, in one of my books, Work on Your Game, that's the first chapter. It's called Cardio for the Mind, Mental Conditioning. So it's kind of like uh, like an athlete gets in shape. Like when we play sports, so it's like any sport that involves running, football, basketball, we do a whole lot of conditioning workouts in preseason, in practice. And what's the point of conditioning? The reason that we do conditioning is a lot of people incorrectly think that the purpose of conditioning, let's say you see some football players running up and down the field or basketball players back and forth on the court in practice, 
is not so that we don't get tired. That's impossible. Now, any human being, I don't care how great of a shape you're in, if I take you to a football field and we sprint up and down that field 10 times, everybody's going to feel fatigued. The difference is the person who is well conditioned might only need about 30 seconds of rest time before they can sprint all over again. Whereas the person who's in poor condition might need 30 minutes or 30 days before they can run again. All right. The difference is just what level of conditioning you're at. How much time do you need to recover from the challenge? And it's the same thing in life. Person who's well mentally conditioned will face a setback. They get themselves five minutes to be annoyed or pissed off about it. And then they can get right back on the horse and keep going. Whereas the person who is poorly conditioned might need five years to get over it. And you no, know, it's 10 years later, they're still complaining and using that same setback from way back in the day as an excuse for them not doing anything today. And I'm sure everybody who's listening probably can think of an example, maybe not you, but somebody you know who's done that. And they're still using something that happened a long time ago as a reason why they're not doing anything today. And it's just because of poor mental conditioning. And the reason people show up poorly mentally conditioned is they just, they're just not aware. They don't know how to get themselves in that mental shape. And that's what slows a lot of people down, just a lack of overall conditioning. And I mean, that's a metaphor you can use for physical health as well. So what are a couple of tips that people can apply right away to really work on their mental conditioning, right? That resilience capacity. Perfect. First thing is, first of all, everybody understands the concept of goals. I would think most people who listen to a podcast about personal development understand the concept of setting goals. Okay. And you should have goals. Goals are a good thing to have. Those are all the outcomes you want to achieve in life and they should be written down. And those stated in the positive and in the affirmative and I use the I statements. So most people get that. OK, the second thing is everyone understands you can't get something for nothing. So what are you willing to do in order to achieve your goals? That's the second step. What are you going to do to achieve these goals? So don't say that you want to make you know, 10 million dollars next year, but you only want to work you know, the four hour work week. You know, this, this great book title, but it's not a real thing. All right, you actually have to put the time in. All right, you got to. Make sure that your actions are, they are relative. They match up to the goals that you want to achieve. So you want to make 10 times more money next year. Or what are you going to do that's going to 10X your inputs to get 10X the output in some way, shape, or form? All right, so those are the things that you're going to have to do to achieve your goals. Most people understand that too. They may not have the right formula yet. And this is where most people spend most of their time is trying to figure out the formula. What do I have to do to achieve these goals, right? Most people spend their whole lives in this cycle. This is what I want. What I have to do. All right, that didn't work. Let me do something different. That didn't work. Let me do something different. They do that there. People spend 60 years of their lives doing this. Now, here's the question that most people never ask Who do I need to be? What type of person do I need to be while I do what I'm doing in order to achieve my goal? Now, we all can understand just by deductive reasoning if you are already this person, you would already be doing the thing and you would already have the outcome. So, since you don't have the outcome yet, that means something about who you're being as a person needs to change. And who you're being is not about actions. They're about, it's the internal. Is what are you thinking? What is your posture, your internal posture? How is your mind conditioned? How are you seeing yourself when you look in the mirror? Who do you see in the mirror? Who are other people seeing in the mirror? And what is your energy? What's your aura? Now, how are you showing up on a daily basis? When that changes, you can take the exact same actions that you were taking last week and get a completely different set of results. This is where everything changes is when you change who you are being as a person. And that's where the mental conditioning comes in, because you can change who you're being in a very short period of time. Like somebody, for example, could get really angry for five minutes. And during that five minutes, because they're angry, their energy changes, their focus changes, the results of their actions change and they get a completely different result. But then the anger goes away. So then the next day you're back to being who you were before and you can't get that. You can't replicate the result. So that's why the mental conditioning matters, because it changes who you're being in a more permanent way. So you stay that way. And now you have a new baseline of who you are that affects your actions more permanently and that affects your results more permanently. So that's why the mental conditioning is similar to the way that somebody eats. You can't eat healthy one day and then say, OK, I'm good. And it's not like if you eat poorly one day, the next day you're going to wake up 100 pounds heavier. It doesn't work that way. It's the cumulative effect of what you're doing. And that's where the discipline comes in. But a lot of people don't like this concept of discipline. And this is what keeps a lot of people from getting mentally conditioned. I'm so glad that you brought up that concept of discipline, because mm -hmm. one of the things that I often hear, and these are also, you know, from very high accomplished people is help me to be more disciplined. Right. So <laughs> how can they do that? 
<laughs> Great question. <laughs> so help me to be more disciplined is actually the wrong question. And that's what keeps a lot of people from actually achieving discipline is that they think, and people say this to me all the time also, simply because I talk about it all the time. Well, Dre, my biggest challenge is I need to be more disciplined. I need to be more focused. I need to be more consistent. Usually I hear those three words, discipline, focus, consistent. I need to be more of these things. And people already understand this, but they're just not doing it. So what I say to anyone who has that challenge if that's the only challenge that you have, then that's then you would already have solved the problem. That's not the problem <laughs> is if you believe the only thing between you and uh, making 10 times more money than you made last year or you losing that last 80 pounds or you getting that job that you want or whatever you're trying to achieve. If that of all it took was you just be more disciplined. Google and YouTube have more than enough of the information that you need to do that. So that's clearly not the, the actual problem. The problem for people who want to be more disciplined is that they don't have the structure in place that allows discipline to be the byproduct. See, discipline is a byproduct. Discipline is not the starting point, it's the end point. And what I explain to people is this. Let's just say, for example, someone wants to go to the gym more often, right? where early in the year, somebody wants to get in better shape, and they didn't do it last year. And they know the only thing is they got to be more disciplined to go to the gym. Okay. What we need to do is put a structure in place and structures don't have to be some big complicated thing, a system. They don't have to be complicated. It's just it can be simple, but this need to be a process that you can follow over and over again. So, for example, lay out your workout clothes the night before. Whatever you're going to eat in the morning before you go to the gym, have that ready. If you know that you go to the gym and what you usually do is sit on one of the machines and play on your phone, then what you need to do instead is hire a trainer who will not let you do that. So that they will tell you what to do because you know you don't know what to do in the gym. Let the trainer tell you what to do. They will direct your workout. So then you know exactly, you know you're doing exactly what you need to be doing. You don't need to figure it out on your own. And you're not leaving it up to your personal willpower to what you do in the gym. The trainer is going to tell you what to do. And since you're paying them, they'll handle everything. All you got to do is show up and listen. Those are, that's a, that right there. If I just stop right there, that's a simple structure. That structure will produce as a byproduct the discipline of you going to the gym consistently, doing what you're supposed to do. And over time, that weight is going to start falling off of you. Just get your workout clothes ready in the morning, have your whatever foods you're going to eat, know where the have the gym be, have your plan for how you're going to get to the gym and have a trainer who's going to take you through a workout. That is simple enough, a structure. The discipline is the byproduct. It is not the starting point. So many people say, well, I'm not doing what I'm doing because I'm not disciplined. And then they can't make themselves be disciplined and they keep trying. It doesn't work and they don't get the outcome. That's because you're asking the wrong question. And what I tell people is, and I'm sure you understand this, right? And uh, any kind of consulting or coaching space, our jobs is not to answer all your questions. Because if all you needed was answers to your questions, again, YouTube and Google can replace us and you don't have to pay YouTube and Google. What we do is provide you better quality questions because the questions that you have are usually not the questions that you need answered. You need a whole different set of questions answered. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at your questions. I may answer a few of them, but a bunch of your questions, we need to replace them with better questions. We ask better questions, you get better answers. Even when you don't have the answers, what that leads to is insights. Now, what I tell people is insights come from being asked questions that you can't answer mm -hmm. because now you got to think. It causes your, it forces your brain to think in ways that it otherwise never would have thought. And that's where the insights come from. It's not from you just getting answers to your questions. Because again, if that's all you need it, there'd be no such thing as podcast, coaching, or consulting because mm -hmm. YouTube and Google will replace all of us. <laughs> so tell me more about the beliefs, right? The, that mindset that we must have, because you even said, you know, a lot of people don't believe that they can do it kind of from where they are today to get to where they want to go. Maybe mm -hmm. they consciously think it might be possible, but they might not believe that it's possible for them. And it sounds like a lot of your audience members are there and that's why they're looking for inspiration and for empowerment. So what can you say to mm -hmm. those individuals that say, yeah, it's everything is possible, but I just, I don't know if it's possible for me. It's a, a great question. And what I tell people to do is borrow your belief from someone else. So I'll give you an example. Um, I'm sorry, but here started the concept of fake it till you make it. Now, I personally don't believe in faking it until you make it. And the reason why is because fake it till you make it is kind of like, uh, you know, the story of Cinderella mm -hmm. and she was uh, she was in the rags and then she put on the, the slipper and she was in a beautiful gown and then the clock struck 12 and then the gown turned back into the rags. That's what happens when you fake it till you make it, because eventually when you tell your subconscious mind that you're faking, 
you're literally telling yourself you're faking, you're pretending to be something that you're not. Eventually, the pretending has to end. And when the pretending ends, you go, you're just like Cinderella. You go from having on the, or was it, was it Cinderella? Yeah, Cinderella. You go from the, the gown to the rags, right? That's what happens when you're faking. It eventually ends. So I'll give you an example. Uh, there was this guy, he was in high school, different high school basketball player. And he was a mediocre player. He was maybe the 10th best player on a, a 15 person team. And one day the coach comes to practice and he says, look, today, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to have each one of you pretend to be one of your teammates all day in practice. And the reason the coach had them do this is because I don't, the coach said, I don't want to be the one always browbeating you and telling you what you're doing wrong. So I'm going to have your teammate pretend to be you and they're going to do what you do wrong. So whatever teammate you're assigned to be, whatever mistakes they always make, you make it. And whatever they do well, you do that. So you're going to show each other who you are. And I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to watch you all so that you all can basically be your own critics. So this guy, he, his, his name is uh, Tucker and his, he got assigned to be his teammate, Mike. Now, Mike happened to be the best player on the team. So just by random luck of the draw, the 10th best player on the team, his assignment that day by his coach is to pretend to be the best player on the team all day in practice. So here's my question. Let me ask you this question and the audience can answer this too. How do you think he played in practice that day? Really well. Yeah, he said he had to, he played basketball that day, but he never played in his life. He had never played that well before. And he has never played that well since, since that day, he played amazingly that day. And the thing is he was making all kinds of shots that he never even tried. He's doing moves that he never did before. And his teammates are looking at him slack jaw. Like where's this coming from? Like, cause they never saw him do this. Because this is in the middle of the season. So they knew, everyone kind of knew who each other was. And now he's doing this. And they're like, wait, where is this coming from? We didn't know you could do this. So they get to the end of practice. And the coach looks at him and says, well, if that's what it takes, you need to pretend to be Mike every day. Now mm -hmm. You need to do that for the rest of your life. But he was not able to replicate that. And the whole point is this. He wasn't faking it. Because when you play basketball, you can't fake the ball going in the basket. Either it goes in or it doesn't. You can't pretend to do a move. Either you did the move or you didn't do the move. And the whole thing is he had tapped into uh, this. I call this the super you. It's still you being you, but you borrow somebody else's confidence and you basically assume their posture. And this is what we talked about. When we talked about mental conditioning. You assume that person's posture. And because you have done that, now you can perform at a level that maybe otherwise you wouldn't have been able to tap into. And now that you've done it, now you don't need to borrow their confidence. Now you can just use yourself as an example because now you've done it. Now you have an example of your, from your own life and now you can just use that and you can do it over and over again. That's a really cool story. I'm really glad you shared it. And, mm -hmm. and what I know to be true is that you're, you're correct in the sense that we can't fake it if there are parts of us that don't really believe that it's possible or safe for us to do that thing. And until we release those unconscious blockages, uh, most of which started very, very early in childhood, I imagine, you know, mm -hmm. um, we, we are going to experience some limitations. Um, and so the uh, concept of borrowing that belief, modeling, if you will, somebody's, you mentioned posture, modeling how they're being, and then we get our own results. And that's evidence to our unconscious mind that we can do it, that it's safe, that it's possible exactly. for us to do it as well. And so I think it's that's just a beautiful true. example. And so what about for those individuals that are saying, you know what, Dre, I have done what you're saying. I have hustled. I have worked my bum off. I have done everything that I can, but I keep hitting obstacles. I keep hitting walls and it's just exhausting. What do you say to those individuals that really have done their best? Hire a coach. <laughs> <laughs> Go find somebody who knows what you don't know, someone who has already achieved the outcome, someone who has a strategy and a system for achieving the outcome and can help you do the exact same thing. The thing is, every problem is figure outable. Right? You don't have a problem. Actually, let me back up. If you have a problem, that's a good thing because all problems have solutions. <laughs> yeah, so if you look outside right now, so like outside, I'm in Miami, Florida. So right now, Miami is 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and cloudy. That's not a problem because you can't fix it. You can't do anything about it. It just is. That's just a thing. It's a circumstance. A problem can be solved. So if your problem is I'm trying to um, get more customers or I'm trying to increase my average cart value or I'm trying to get more traffic to my funnel, those are problems because they can be solved. And it, is there anybody out there who's making the amount of money you're trying to make? 
Is there anybody out there who has the number of customers you're trying to have? Is there anybody out there who you're, they did an event and they have 10, 10 times more people coming to their event than you had coming to your event? The answer is yes. That means there's someone out there who has figured out the problem that you have, which means the only difference between the only difference between where you're at and where you want to be is usually getting access to the information, the insights, and the knowledge. And the good thing about the internet, and the internet is not all good, but the one good thing about the internet is that you can easily find the people who have already solved the problem that you have. So the only gap between where you are and where you want to be is you just accessing the information from those people. So go find the people who can help you out. And what I tell people is that there are 8 billion people on the planet here, Barrett, so why would you try to do everything by yourself? It doesn't make any sense. That's the most inefficient way to do things is by yourself. When there are 8 billion people on the planet, utilize other people. Like we are in the era of collaboration. I mean, we're collaborating right now, right? I'm here on, on your show. You have an audience. I have a background. I have some things that I can share and we're collaborating. So this is the era that we're in. When you use social media, you're collaborating with them. They have the people, you have the content. Our Instagram doesn't make content. We make the content. They have the people. So leverage other people, leverage their brains, and you can get a lot more done through other people than you will ever get done by yourself. Yeah, thank you. I think that's great advice. I have my own coaches. And so I know that to be absolutely true. Right. And I also know that some people, they buy program programs, they read the books, they listen to the podcast, they learn from the experts, but there's still a gap, you know, so they may put some of that into their behavior, but they still mm -hmm. don't get the results or they're slower, or they again, hit those obstacles. And so mm -hmm. what is that missing link? Hmm. So they have they have gotten the information, but they're still not getting the results that they want. Sometimes right. it can just be time. Sometimes you just need to put more time in. Not everybody gets the results at the same pace. Sometimes you may be basically, sometimes you may be driving on the wrong highway. Sometimes you're just in the wrong vehicle. Like before I got into basketball, like I said, I played a little bit of baseball, played a little bit of football. Had I stayed in those and tried to kind of force my way through in those areas because you no know, quitters never win and winners never quit. Had I not been smart enough to quit the wrong thing, then I wouldn't have got into the right thing. I mean, how many people here listening are in a, a happy relationship, but in order to get into that one, you had to leave the last one, right? You got to leave the, you got to get off the wrong train to get on the right train. So sometimes you may just be in the wrong vehicle. You may be just uh, trying to solve the wrong problem and not everybody's going to solve the same problem. So it could be that it could be just a matter of you putting in more time it could be you just checking yourself. Hey, am I actually applying this the way that it's supposed to be applied? So if you are getting information from somebody, let them be accountable. Let them hold you accountable and say, hey, hey, Mr. Uh, coach, Mr. Mentor, Mr. Mastermind Partner, am I actually applying this the way that it's supposed to be applied? Am I doing anything wrong here? Do I just need more time? Am I missing something? And let them hold you accountable. This is something else that I notice in the world that we're in today, Vered, in this uh, selfie era. It's not even a selfie generation because the generation would say there's a certain age group, but it's everybody. The selfie era is we all are, it's all about me, right? It's all about me and how great I am. And we're all, we all have a little bit of this in us. And that causes a lot of people to not have the uh, humility. And I don't use that word a lot, but have the humility to be held accountable by somebody who says, hey, what you're doing right here is not right. This needs to be fixed. And if we are not being held, allowing ourselves to be held accountable for where we may be coming up short, we may think we're doing everything we're supposed to be doing, but we're not getting the outcome. And again, going back to what I said earlier, if there is someone who has already achieved the outcome that you want to achieve and you have not yet achieved it, and you're telling yourself, I've done everything, you're lying. <laughs> this is such a brilliant conversation, Dre. I'm so grateful to you. And I'm particularly appreciating that you brought up the possibility that we might be in the wrong vehicle, wrong lane, mm -hmm. uh, because that is true. Sometimes when something doesn't work out, it's a lesson, it's a learning. And, and perhaps we are um, invited to explore something that's even higher and better for us. And mm -hmm. that requires us to, to, to be mindful of that and to be curious, right? To kind of loosen the grip on, you know, something to give ourselves permission to explore other things. And there is an ending there because if I have done something for many, many, many years, even let's say, you know, or a certain profession or a certain something, and I've invested a lot in it, 
boy, is it hard to let that go because mm-hmm. that's a real grief, right? Sometimes it's a grief of an identity, right? Mm-hmm. For me to, to go somewhere different, do something different. And so what I know for sure is that for me to enter into a transition into something else that might be even better for me, I must have an ending of that old vehicle, so to speak. I must, um, you know, be be conscious of allowing that grief, that loss to be accepted and felt for me to even be able to create something new. Like you had to let go of, you know, baseball and, you know, I think you said volleyball. I can't remember the, the other thing. And football. Football, yeah. thank you. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, but the idea here is that we must own where we are. And sometimes that, that does come from conversations with coaches or people that we trust that can kind of help us to see the truth of where we are. And so that's kind of that tricky thing is when do I let go and when do I stick with it and, and you know, put more effort into it or more energy? What are your thoughts about that? That is the paradox of life, what you just explained. And as I talked about earlier, Bered, uh, the only way you know whether you are a, a brilliant visionary or a delusional fool is how the story ends. And you can't, I think it was Steve Jobs. I think that famous um, commencement speech that he gave, I believe it was at Stanford, where he talks about you can only put the puzzle together looking backwards, right? So you can't, you can't predict it. I mean, if there was a way for us to predict it, then AI and robots would take over the world. We would all just be doing everything by programming and all right, we know exactly how it's going to go. Humans would become extinct because all of us in our randomness would be unnecessary. Everything would just go in a straight line and ones and twos. So it doesn't work that way. It, that is really what makes life life is that we get to make decisions. We get to these points where you got to decide, all right, do I stay here or do I go? Do I go left or do I go right? I come to this fork in the road, which way am I going to go? And the thing is, uh, people who become successful have the conditioned mindset that we make decisions where we don't know whether this is the right one or the wrong one, but we figure out a way to make it the right one. Whether it's, even if we end up, if I make this left-hand turn and it turns out, hey, I should have went right we figure out a way to kind of maneuver away such that we end up winning anyway. That's what the conditioning, that's what the conditioned mindset is about. See, having a great, a a strongly conditioned mindset is not about you always making the right decision or always being correct. It's about you find a way to end up successful, regardless of the mistakes that you make, regardless of the, and regardless of the fact that you can't control most of the things that happen to your life anyway, like 99% of our lives are out of our control. Uh, Many people don't like to think about that or really get conscious of it, but 99% of what happens, you don't control. I have all these electronics on my desk. I'm not an electrician. Like anything could happen to any one of these. They could catch on fire. It could blow up. I don't know. I don't know how to stop it. I can't do anything about it. I can't control the weather. I can't control any other human being on the planet and what they do. When I walk outside of my door, I have no idea what another person is going to do. I can't control any of that. All I can control is what I do and how I respond to it. And what I tell people is that the more of that 1% of control that you take ownership of, the more you start to have influence over the 99%. And that's what really life is all about. Don't try to be perfect. It's impossible. You'll fail. It's just understanding that no matter how things go, I'm going to take full control of this 1% and make it work in my favor no matter what. That's right. And I believe that that's the very core of empowerment true mm-hmm. empowerment, you know, true, what you called control or freedom, right? The ability to navigate life because there is no wrong choice per se, as mm-hmm. long as we are moving forward, we're doing the best that we can. We follow our guidance, right? We stay conditioned, as you said, so that whatever ideas do come to us are coming not from a place of fear, but rather from a more empowered place. And, you know, and that's where we have the certainty. So I'm so grateful to you, Dre. You really, you really get this. And I, and I got that sense by listening to your videos kind of in preparation for today. Um, So what you shared, I'm certain uh, will help many, many people. How can they learn more about you, your programs, your books? Oh, well, I'm everywhere. I'm all over the internet. Uh, I I use the Instagram a lot. I use the Instagram stories a lot. So people just want to get a feel for my this personality and my, my on the daily. My Instagram is just my name at Dre Baldwin. I do have a book that I'll give people a free copy of. They just cover the shipping. Can I share that? 
Of course, please. All right, so I got a lot of books, but I'll give people a free copy of this one called The Mirror of Motivation. Subtitle is The Self-Guide to Self-Discipline. So this book is all about that being part. So most people understand setting goals. They understand you have to work to reach your goals, but many people never ask themselves the question, who do I need to be? This book is about asking and answering that question for yourself. I'm not going to answer it for you because that wouldn't make any sense. You're going to answer it. I'm just going to give you the frame for asking the question. So that's what the mirror motivation is about. That's why it's called the mirror is you looking in the mirror, not the window, the mirror. So you can look in the mirror and this book is going to help you ask the question, who do I need to be? It's going to help you answer that question. And it's going to help you kind of ingrain that into your subconscious mind, which controls 85% of your thoughts anyway. And that controls the outcomes of your life. So I'll give you the book free. Just cover the shipping. Just go to mirrorofmotivation.com. The book's free. Just cover the shipping. Again, mirrorofmotivation.com. Beautiful. Thank you for that. And thank you again for your wisdom, your insights, your humility, uh, and just telling it like it is and empowering us to do um, the extraordinary, which I believe you are doing every day and helping many people do the same. So once again, thank you. I much appreciate it. I appreciate you sharing your platform and giving me the opportunity.